morning, we are joined by Peter Smith uh, from the Sheffield Hallam University. Good morning, Peter, and thank you for joining us. Um, okay. And um, just the usual admin, um, you will have the space to ask us any questions as we go. Uh, so either feel free to unmute yourself or um, if the conditions um, are not right enough for you to speak, feel free to drop us a message in the chat. Um, but I'm not going to speak anymore. I'm just going to introduce Pete. Um, so uh, Pete joined Sheffield Hallam University um, in 2008. And as an information advisor, um, working with law and criminology students and staff, with the creation of the library research support team in 2016, Pete became a research support librarian, working with the Faculty of Development and Society and leading on researcher skills development in the team. He became team leader for research data management in 2018. As lead for research data management, he is responsible for reviewing data management plans, providing training in RDM and managing Sheffield Hallam University DMP online templates and guidance. Um, so this is a little bit of introduction of Pete, but I'll just mute myself and uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so you don't just have to watch me in our delightful craft room here. I'll share my screen and uh, I've just got a little, little, um, an old slideshow, I hope. But, Brilliant. Uh, I'll just make you a presenter. Um, give me two seconds and hopefully it's going to be quite easy to understand um, how to share the screen. Brilliant. Okay, so hopefully you can see a presentation now. Um, so, there's Sheffield Hallam University, a lovely shot of our city campus there. Um, the bottom right, if you're familiar with Sheffield, you might recognise the roof of the AdSets building, which is where I would normally be working. But today I'm speaking to you from the lovely craft room in our house on City Road. Just a bit about Sheffield Hallam University. We have around 30,000 enrolled students across three colleges and four research institutes. As you can see from the strap line on the slides, uh, our ambition is to be an applied university, indeed the world's leading applied university. Um, so we teach from foundation degree all the way through to doctoral level and we have staff active in research across all colleges. Um, just to give you a flavour of the kind of research we do, we've recently opened the Advanced Wellness Research Centre um, at the Olympic Legacy Park here in Sheffield, and that's focusing on physical activity and its contribution to physical and emotional well-being. So I talk about research because, as Magdalena mentioned, I'm part of the library research support team. Five team members, there's one head of team, and that's Eddie Faban. Some of you may be familiar with him from his work on research data management, and then four research support librarians. Now we have a fairly traditional liaison type role, so we work with colleges and research institutes to make sure what we do is useful to them. I work with social sciences and with the social and economic research institute there. And then we have cross-cutting responsibilities, and one of those for me is research data management. Um, so I'm responsible for arranging and delivering training. So that's class-based training, going to doctoral school inductions, that sort of thing, and support. So as probably a lot of you have been doing, a lot of Zoom and Collaborate calls over the past few months, providing one-to-one -one type support for people with data management. A lot of my work is around data management plans and specifically data management plan reviews. So colleagues will submit a data management plan as part of their ethics application. And that will be then sent to us. We get an alert in our email and then I'll review the plan. And that will either start or continue a conversation with the researcher about data management planning. I'm also responsible for getting stuff onto our research data archive. So staff register their data sets there. Then I review those data sets and work with them to make sure we have the right data and the access conditions are set and so forth. OK, 
Turning to our hosts for today, looking at the use of DMP online over the past year, we've had 117 new accounts created and 102 new plans, which represents about half of the plans that we've had sent in. So a reasonable amount of use, certainly enough for us to justify to the, uh, the purse holders that we want to keep DMP online. But people do also download templates from our website or use local documents as well. And maintaining the guidance and templates on DMP online, as Magdalena mentioned in the intro, is another part of my job. So when there's a big university website rejug, uh, rejuggle a few months ago, I had to go into DMP online to make sure all the links are working, that sort of thing. So what are some of the challenges we face with regard to data management? Well, one is the number of plans we get. Okay. So as we get a reasonable portion of our plans through DMP online, and we get a fair number of plans, they only represent about half the plans we should get. University policy states that all data related research has to have a plan, but only about 50 to 55% do. Then there's the content of those plans, the quality of the plans. Now that has improved, but every so often you realize that people are occasionally just cutting and pasting the guidance from DMP online or from our documentation, putting it into their plan. So how much thought are people giving to certain aspects of their plan? And in particular, data archiving. We don't get very many data sets, and that may be connected to people not paying as much attention in their planning to that aspect of their work. So we're looking at getting more plans, getting those plans to be more detailed, and in particular, getting people to think about what's going to happen to their data at the end of the project. Because the lack of plans means there's lots of projects going on we don't know about, where that data is, how secure it is, what's happening to it. And the lack of data sets means, again, we don't really know what's happening to a lot of this very useful data when projects are completed. So our recently, relatively recently appointed head of service, Nick Woolley, he joined us from Northumbria last year, is very interested in using open research as a framework for the library's research support offer. So I've been working with my colleague B, who's responsible for open access, uh, on putting together an open research uh, policy proposal, putting together an open research guide, and looking at training around open research so that hopefully we can get more plans, get better plans, and get more data sets. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen shortly and invite any questions, comments, observations. Thank you so much, Pete. Um, if you have any questions for Pete, either feel free to unmute yourself or feel free to type in the chat. Okay, so we received the first question from Kirsten. Um, she's asking me, uh, do you monitor if researchers from your university archive their data in other data repositories? Uh, this could be a reason for low data archiving numbers in the institutional repository. Hi, Kirsten. Thank you. Yes, we do. That's a very good question. And it was something that Eddie brought up. So we have a look on data site there and other places. And there's a, a small number of data sets that have been put in other repositories. And then when we find those, we find out them if they can at least create a metadata record on Shurda, which is our archive. Um, but having done that, it doesn't turn out there's a vast number of people putting data somewhere else that we don't know about. So there's still an issue that people aren't registering their data sets anywhere, really. So as an example, one person put their data on GitHub, for example, and then we got them to put a metadata record in Shurda, but there's not a vast hinterland of undiscovered data, I'm afraid. It would be nice if it were, because then we just have to get them to, to register it. Yeah, um, uh, so, yeah, I've got the chat open, Magdalena, so I can see the questions. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Uh, so, Wendy's asked, how does the DMP link with data protect the impact assessments? The honest answer is I don't know. It's a terrible part of my part, but I should get back to our data protection officer. Uh, Lena, yes, we do know um, one of our other follow ups is on open access publishing. So, when we're looking at people's publishing, where they have put their data as a supplementary item in the journal, we make a note of that in our compliance reports as well. Uh, but to go back to Wendy's question, one of the big discussions we do have with data management plans is how people are thinking about data protection. 
particularly the whole anonymization versus pseudonymization type thing. One of the really important things about me is I used to be a law librarian. Um, so if anything comes up around data protection or copyright, I will invoke the I am not a lawyer and I am not going to advise you. Please find the lawyer in the world. I'll say, as a librarian, this is what I know, this is what I've read, but I'm no better placed in many ways than you to actually say what's going to happen. So either get legal advice or take the risk yourself. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> See also copyright advice. Or I go on Twitter and ask Charles Oppenheim and uh, Ruth Malalia and they help me out. Networking, it's good. How do you convince researchers that know everything to join your training sessions? Um, I'm a fat middle-aged white guy from Birmingham, so I can be more arrogant than almost anybody, so I just bully them into it. No. Um, that is very difficult. I think a lot of it is um, about one-to-one -one advocacy sometimes. So sometimes you'll say, well, don't come to the training session, but what is it that you need to know specifically? So sometimes it's about saying, okay, you feel you know everything and that's fine so we might say well here's a new thing so sometimes you might say well there's a new development so gdpr was a good hook for a while come and learn all about data protection and the new regulations and while you're here here's some other stuff about data like data archive and so on so you can use a hook of what people can't know because it's new for example uh, how do you reach out to researchers um nothing special on you i'm afraid if everybody has got some really good ideas um, so a lot of it is building on previous relationships. So as I say, I used to be the law librarian, so I had a liaison experience in departments. So a lot of the time, it's just building on previous relationships. Trading on the fact that I'm a doctoral researcher, that I'm a researcher myself, often helps. Now, I am one of you, really, as well as I'm a librarian. So I found learning this stuff useful. Um, so we have a research and knowledge exchange newsletter, so that goes out to everyone. So we make sure we have material in there. We go along to meetings and talk to people. We leverage our relationships with the research and innovation services in the doctoral school, so we get them to advocate for us as well. We build good relationships with the, the head of research development committee. So that sometimes it's getting people more powerful and important than us to speak for us. So cultivating good relationships with the new head of with the new pro vice chancellor and getting her to put our agenda into hers sometimes. So yeah, sometimes it's about being political with a small p really it's about who to speak to who's powerful but who's to speak to who's effective as well so it's nice it's not the pro vice chancellor is great she's new and she's very enthusiastic but who are people going to listen to within those structures um how do you handle controlled restricted access good question from lindsay um so when people deposit their data sets which is very rare we have a discussion um so we either have standard creative commons licenses or we have an embargo period and that's registered in the data set and that's then automatically managed or we set a, 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 an access protocol which is generally um, people who want the data set will email us and then we will get in touch with the, the data set owner as it were to say is this a legit person or we'll set a protocol so only people with an academic email address can have this data set that kind of thing so part of our open research project is working on some new licenses that were a bit more flexible than CC. Um, so, for example, allowing access to data, but not sharing it on where that data is quite sensitive, that sort of thing. Um, so we use standard licenses or we use sort of bespoke licenses where appropriate. I hope that answers the question, Lindsay. Uh, Tina, does the university archive save the DMPs? Um, not in any proactive way. <laughs> No, um, but they do go into the ethics management system, so they're all there. And of course, the ones that are created in DMP online are also in there as well. So we don't have an active process of archiving them, but they are there in the ethics application system if we needed to access them. And that's a good question. Maybe we need to start saving them proactively elsewhere. Um, I think this is more a question, Wendy, for Magdalena about whether DMP Online and DMP Tool are going to merge into a single tool or are they going to be kept separate? Um, yeah, so um, 
I, I can comment on that one. Uh, we actually merged the two code bases about three years ago into DMP roadmap, and now we both deliver a product based on that open source code base. So um, maybe some people don't understand uh, where the DMP tool and DMP online is. Sam, do you want to explain or um, should we pick up on this? Or did, did you not catch that before? Um, basically, DMP online and DMP tool used to be two different uh, Ruby on Rails uh, software solutions that were tackling the same problem of, of trying to create a structure to answer DMPs. We merged two and a half years ago, and that's what made the, the DMP roadmap code base that we're all uh, running today. Okay, so there's an earlier question I missed from Bev. Sorry, do you review every DMP or only on request? I review every DMP that we get. So every DMP that goes into Converis, which is the system use for ethics application, I review, or if I'm not around, then um, Eddie will review it. Okay. Um, just so with funded projects, in case you want to know, we have a slightly more proactive approach. So I will go into Converis regularly, look for UKRI projects that have been awarded, and then we contact the, uh, the PI and say, hey, congratulations, you've got an ESRC grant. Here's the ESRC's policy, in case you don't know it, and here's how we can help you comply with open access and data management. Sometimes that starts a brilliant conversation, sometimes it's tumbleweed, but at least we're making the effort. And then midway through the project, we send a reminder, how's it going? And then we, um, at the end of the project, and we, I do this for every DMP I review, I put a note in my calendar to say, contact this researcher to say, I see you've finished data, protect, uh, data collection. Hope it's really gone well. How are things? How can we help you? By the way, have you thought about sharing your data? Let's have that conversation. Again, some people get back and say, it's great. Yep, I'll be in touch. Some people you hear nothing from. But at least we have that attempt to contact people, connect with them. Um, and like I said, be a bit more proactive, particularly with the funding projects because there's compliance issues. That's what we want to make sure we're getting the data set, uh, set where possible. So Lab for Living recently got a massive grant, £3 million, uh, from Research England to do a lot of work around design for the future home, because we're all going to live longer, or at least feel like we are at the moment. Um, and so we had a brilliant conversation with the uh, the project manager and with the PIs there about data sets and data archiving. Um, so to go back to that reaching out question, um, we everybody who gets a, a DMP online gets an email from us saying, this plan is good, or please change the plan in this way, and then we'll be in touch later, and then we send a later email when they finish. Uh, at the moment, particularly whenever it's come up, I say, oh, I see according to records, you should have completed data collection, but has COVID-19 got in the way? How are things? And a few people have got back and said, yeah, we've had to put it off six months so I can update our records. Other people say, no, luckily we completed before lockdown and we carry on the conversation. So yeah, so we use the DMP review process as a bit of a, a way in or the funding process as a bit of a way in as well. <laughs> Do you keep your DMP on the DMP uh, online or export to another uh, system? Uh, people, oh, if they, people are sending it to us, sorry, Wendy, if I don't get the tenor of this question right, but people have to then export their DMP as a PDF, which they then upload to Converis for, for me to review. If they wanted to, they could email me and say it's in DMP online, and I can look it in there, but they still have to attach it to Converis, so it's there with all the other projects documentation in case the ethics reviewers want to look at it because some ethics reviewers do some don't they think you know library looking at that but some want to look at a data management plan which is great the more eyes the better mm -hmm. oh and lindsay you're welcome oh uh convarious uh convarious i'll just type the answer in the chat there um it it is uh, it's a Clarivate system. We use it for thank you, Kirsten. Yeah, we use it for ethics and grants application. Um, it is the absolute bane of my life between everybody here. Um, it's even clunkier than me on meeting people for the first time socially. Um, but nevertheless, is what we paid for. Uh, so people apply for funds through Converis. They do the ethics application through Converis. 
Um, we use ePrints to anticipate a possible question uh, for our data archive. Uh, we're looking at maybe being able to feed from elements into there. So at the moment, people put their material straight into the ePrints instance, but there's a plan to use elements to get stuff onto the data archive as well. Compliance reporting, a big honking old spreadsheet is what that consists of. Um, so every year, um, B, who looks after open access, and I will go through elements to look for funded publications. We'll go through Scopus and other sources, and we'll then check were they published gold OA or with an applicable, you know, appropriate green um, embargo. We'll look at whether there's a data set or a supplementary materials or something else. We'll just fill that spreadsheet in and send it off. Um, Converius isn't a Chris system, well, it's potentially, but we don't we don't have one system that does everything. We've kind of got a Frank and Chris, if you'll pardon that expression. So we have elements for publications, we have Converius for ethics and grants, and then we have ePrints for um, archiving. It is, it is a lot of work um, trying to connect all those things together, uh, and I would like to uh, shout out to our metadata services team who do a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of getting stuff onto the research archive and making sure that they all work together as well. Um, so, may, you know, if people could put their data into elements, that would remove a lot of work as well. Yes, yes, we do. So PGRs have to submit data management plans. Um, and a lot of the increase in the number of data management plans has come from PGRs because I go to inductions very clearly say they have to write DMP, so we do get a lot of PGR materials, and I review their plans, and we have the same follow-up with them as well, including data archiving. So a lot of my work is actually with PGRs at the moment. Just in case you're wondering, I didn't review my own data management plan. I got Eddie to do that for me, for full disclosure there. And I did resent writing it. So, but that all joking aside, doing a research project, even if you've not put yourself through the torment of doing a PhD like I have, is a good thing to do if you're in research support. Because it gives you that insight into what it's like to follow procedures and protocols within your institution. What it's like to use Convarius, what it's like to use Elements, what it's like to use DMP online, what it's like to do an RF1 or RF2. It's really helpful. So as a team, when we started, we did a research project for that purpose. We wrote a data management plan, we um, wrote an ethics application, we um, set up an archive, we did all it according to protocol, so it's really helpful. Okay, I'm just waiting to see whether any more questions are coming, but it's been um, great with all of these questions coming through. Um, I don't know whether anyone else has a question for you, um, but if not, um, and if you can just think of a question, feel free to either type it here in the chat and um, we can still ask Pete as we go. Or um, if you all have more questions, feel free to drop us an email to DMP online and I'll just pass it to Pete um, if that's okay. Um, so um, he can answer the questions. Oh, um, we just received one more. Has introducing DMPs made a difference? Um, I wasn't around when they were introduced, uh, Wendy. So um, the current sort of infrastructure for data management was largely created by Eddie back in 2014. So he came to Shu as the research data manager, very much to set up an infrastructure for data alongside the open access stuff. Um, so at one point, we were getting no data management plans. So at a technical philosophical level, yes, it's made an infinite difference, um, I guess. Um, I think what's what's making a difference more than that is going along to doctoral school inductions, talking directly to PGRs. That's what's made the big difference there. You know, you're saying you have to do this to people who are at a position when they're like, yes, right, of course I do. Great, I've got to do everything properly. OK, um, holding some data. We held a couple of data conversations. You may be familiar with those from Cambridge and Lancaster. So we uh, we borrowed the idea shamelessly and that worked really well. 
um, because it was academics talking to other academics, so getting peers talking to peers, I think has also made a big difference. That's why we want to set up this Open Research Champions Network. And that's why me being a peer as well does make a bit of a difference. I can say I've written a DMP, it's really helped. And an induction sometimes, previous doctoral researchers will come along and say, yeah, I wrote a DMP, it really helps. So having practical examples of how it's helped people do the projects uh, has been very helpful as well. Um, so it's certainly, I think, made sure that more people are using the appropriate storage, using the right storage. Um, it's helped, again, I say it's a way into starting conversations about other things. So with COVID, more and more people working off campus, we had a big push just after the lockdown to provide advice on how to move data around securely. So people who've written data management plans or are about to write data management plans is a good way in to talk about using things like Zen 2 and the remote desktop and things like that. Um, okay, Linnea, so what do you do if researchers say in a DMP that they plan to share personal data openly? Uh, I pull a very anguished face like this. Ah, um, and then I say, no, don't do that. And we have a conversation about what anonymous actually means legally and how it's very, very difficult to anonymize data. And sometimes I, I send an article that was written in The Guardian or something that my colleague Dorothy Asalo in America will share with me to say, look, it's really hard to anonymize data. So if you say you're doing that, you've got to be clear that's what you're doing. Otherwise, make sure that you're talking about pseudonymous data, that you're putting that in the information sheet, that you're getting consent to do it, and that people understand what's going to be shared. So in my case, I've said to the participants who are legal academics, I'm going to redact the data as much as I can. Right, so I won't say where you work, or what your role is, or what your project titles were. But if you still don't want me to share the data, then I won't. And in the end, I might not share any of the data. I personally might feel that it's still too identifiable. You can still tell who these people are. And this isn't particularly controversial stuff. So we have a conversation again, and we point them to really good GDPR support materials. Do you are you using anonymous in the popular sense of the term or the strict legal sense? Because they are different. Because GDPR, like most legislation, is fuzzy and not particularly helpful. Okay. Um, but yeah, we always say if you want to share the data, get consent and really, really explain very carefully on the informed consent sheet what that means. Who's going to be able to see that data? What are they going to be able to do with it? And also we rely on the ethics reviewers as well to pick up on that, and they do. Okay, so ethics reviewers will have, I think, have had GDPR training, and they'll be very clear about that as well. So there's two people. Just, I'm sorry to use this word because we're all probably sick of it by now, uh, but they're a backstop as well. So there's two points at which somebody's saying, eh, have you thought about this? And we, we really say it's about risk, isn't it? It's about risk management. Most legal things are in the end about risk assessment. How comfortable are you? And some people say, you know, I'm working with a very small data set. So even if I redacted it really well, it's just too sensitive, I can't share it. And we're like, that's great. As long as you can make the argument why you can't share it. But if somebody's a bit gung-ho, yeah, I want to put this data, I believe in open research. We're like, yeah, that's great. But this is like, uh, a patient set of data with a very small group of people who have this condition, maybe you shouldn't. Okay, so yeah, we do check. Is it anonymous? Is it pseudonymous? What's happening here? Uh, we have that, that conversation. Uh, and, and if all else fails, I set the head of ethics on them. Okay, um, this has been brilliant. Um, thank you so much for all the questions. Um, I think we can just continue quickly. Um, yeah, well done, Pete, and thank you for answering all these questions. Like, I'm not by any means a data management expert. You're, you're seeing that question about data protection impact assessments. So I kind of assume a lot of legal stuff happens elsewhere within the data protection office. Nobody's ever asked me about it. Nobody's come from there to say, what's happening with data protection? Maybe I should get in touch with them. Um, you know, uh, data management, between all of us, data management kind of fell into my lap like a lot of things do. <laughs> My yes. if it wasn't something I actively chose yes. to do. My particular interest is in research development and public engagement, as my PhD is about. Um, so, yeah, with a lot of legal stuff, particularly like that conversation around anonymity, it's very much we have a conversation. This is what I know as a librarian. This is what I understand. OK, but you are the PI. The risk is yours. So please 
take what our advice, and that's the same for copyright, and then make those decisions. And we can point them to the DPO for advice. We can point them to the Head of Ethics for advice as well. They gather as much advice as possible, and they make, make their decisions. Brilliant. Um, thank you, Pete, so much. Um, and after the session, I'll be uh, sending out emails um, to our subscribers and potential subscribers, as well as the GISC mailing list. I'll try to tidy up a little bit of the notes we're trying to write during the session as well. Um, and I'll be sharing some of the questions and answers as well uh, for all of you. Um, but I think we can just continue. Um, we, we don't have that much, but I thought it would be nice to keep you up to date with a few things our team has been working on. Um, so first thing, I'm just going to share my screen quickly here. And I just wanted to let you know, um, um, in hopefully interesting project we have been working on um, uh, with Patricia. And since we are currently having uh, more than 55 subscribers, we want to be a little bit more transparent um, with all of our services. And uh, we realize that sometimes the information that is in the contract um, might never access the administrators of DMP online. So we are putting together a welcome pick, uh, which we will be distributing with all of our subscribers, um, where we are trying to explain um, how does our help desk operate, um, where is the guidance for the administrators. We do have the written material on GitHub and recently I have put together the basic videos of all of the GitHub materials, but this is an ongoing project and also ways how to keep up to date with the MP online news, um, how to engage with us and um, we are also just covering um, the subscription so you can understand what you subscribe for. And if you're on basic subscription, um, you can see the benefits of the enhanced uh, subscription. And for those who are subscribed to the enhanced package, um, there are quite a few steps to go through uh, when it comes to branding and getting your own URL and changing colors. So again, we are just trying to be a little bit more transparent in the whole process. Um, so we explain this and we are also covering uh, the useful terminology. So I'll just go quickly through uh, what we currently have. So we have the help desk, um, which we operate from Monday to Friday between nine and five UK times. And we are just um, explaining here how we go about when you report um, back or um, you, you have something, maybe a new feature request or something that is not working for you um, and how we go really about replying and getting back to you. Um, we are also explaining um, how long it might take for us to get back to you. So um, this is also in the contract, but like I said, we realize maybe these things um, never reach the administrators. So in here, we are just explaining if it's something um, where you can still work around the DMP online, but it's just, um, for example, a plan didn't appear, um, we we will be having um, some time to get back to you and I will not be going into the details, um, but we have category one, two and three. And depending on the seriousness, whether you are able to access the MP online completely, uh, not able to access the MP online completely, or it might be something quite um, minor, although probably for your institution bigger, but from point of view of using the MP online, we have up to 60 days um, to get back to you. Um, we are also highlighting the guidance because um, sometimes um, the links can get lost from the emails and also explaining that we are having the social media. So if you're interested to um, see what we are currently working on and the advertising for these um, DMP online drop-in sessions or other things, it's a good way to keep up to date. And um, we are also explaining um, how you can engage with us. So. Um, we are running two trainings a year. Um, we we also try to run two to three user groups a year. And from September, um, and I'll be talking a little bit more in a minute about this, uh, we are hoping to start DMP Online demo sessions. And we have these DMP Online drop-ins you took part of today. And then we explain what you got with your subscription and what are the differences between the subscriptions also how we go about invoicing and what it means for you if you're on annual or for year long subscription. And again, just the difference between the branding that from the orange colors, if you're enhanced clients, you can change the colors um, to your own ones. 
and how we go really about the whole customization. And at the end, we just cover uh, what is the roadmap work, what does UAT stand for, uh, what is the base description, what does the training event mean, and different things. So I hope uh, you'll find this document useful. Um, if you have some more insights of what you would like to, us to add into this document, uh, get in touch with that, get in touch with us at DMP online at bcc.ac.uk. Um, we are always welcoming uh, any more suggestions, but we are trying to finalize this. And um, as soon as we have this ready for you, uh, we'll be sharing it with all of our current subscribers. So this is just a little sneak peek into this. Let me close this document. Um, and one more thing I wanted to really um, just highlight for everyone who is taking, um, who is participating today is that from September um, we are starting DMP online uh, demo sessions. You can read more uh, about this. I'm sure Patricia will just share the links with you in the chat. Um, and you can take a survey uh, where we are just trying to uh, gather what will be useful for you. Um, but we are thinking to run these once a month and uh, we'll be always going through either new feature or existing feature. Um, I'm thinking it might last between 30 to one hour, 30 minutes to one hour, and um, we'll be covering the new feature or existing feature, and we can even go into online breakout rooms where you can discuss the feature and we can all come back together and see what works well for you, whether we should also update our guidance and um, hopefully make, make the feature clear for you. Um, I don't know um, whether I feel I'm speaking too much, so maybe uh, Patricia can just say a little bit about the real side, if that's okay. Yeah, I can give you a break. Um, there's not that much in terms of use, news, but um, um, I guess it's interesting for you to know that there's like um, one version of the the big software upgrade uh, that we we uh, were working on over the last few weeks uh, ready um, and um, Magdalena and I will spend the next few days uh, testing that uh, um, intensively and uh, hoping to find all the issues with it but uh, I'm also hoping that there aren't too many um, and that um, means that that piece of work um, is like closer to being completed um, and we can then um, yeah um, look at the the list of all the features that you've asked uh, for and see what we will be working on um, after that um, so yeah that's on track I guess is the good news yeah um, and just a few more things uh, to close. Uh, so again, I'm sure uh, Patricia will just share the links in the chat if that's okay. But our July newsletter is out. So if you want to read more about uh, what we have been working on or see uh, when our next DMP line drop-in sessions will be, um, subscribe to the newsletter and have a look at the July one. Um, and also the July recording is now live on the YouTube um, and we have a whole playlist of all of these sessions there as well. So just feel free to follow all the links. I'm not sure whether there are any more questions. Um, but if not, um, let me just to conclude. Thank you very much, uh, Pete, for fantastic talk today and everyone for joining us today and it's been very inspiring and, and very insightful um, and thank you for sharing um, all about the research data management from Sheffield um, University and if you are not following us on the social media um, feel free to follow us on Twitter, Facebook and LinkedIn and subscribe to our monthly newsletters to keep up to date um, with all of these DMP online drop-in sessions and our work. And for everyone who is here, um, don't forget to join us on our next drop-in meeting, which is going to be on the 23rd of September, half past 10. And our guest speaker will be Chris Gibson from the University of Manchester. So I think that's all from me. And thank you all. I mean, thank you. Goodbye.